Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the uh, welcome to HPC uh, using OpenStack. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to introduce the panelists very quickly, and uh, we are going to use the Etherpad. If you're familiar with OpenStack, we do that a lot uh, for people to ask questions originally. And we have start we uh, when we propose the uh, session, we started putting uh, questions in the Etherpad already. Uh, feel free to, to extend. Uh, the idea is that for the first 20 minutes, we're gonna, for half of the session at least, we'll try to answer questions from the Etherpad, then we'll open it to the floor. Uh, if you wanna ask questions, please go to the microphone. Uh, but first, let me introduce the people uh, that are gonna be uh, 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 your panelists. So uh, we're gonna start from the end. Uh, hi, Stig. Uh, Six Telfler uh, has a background in research and uh, development, uh, and he's been uh, working for many uh, companies. He does a lot of work uh, nowadays uh, with CERN, among other things. Uh, not with CERN, no. So, but one of the main projects that um, we are lucky to be involved in is the Square Kilometer Array, the SKA. So. Uh, he's a CTO of Stack HPC. Um, and they do research computing. He's also one of the co-chair of the Scientific SIG. Uh, next to Stig, we have uh, Jim Golden. Uh, Jim, uh, what do you do? Uh, <laughs> oh, I have to introduce myself. Um, <laughs> so I work at uh, NIST. Um, I run uh, a cloud there, and we do um, uh, scientific um, evaluations. And um, we do, um, uh, what is it? Um, um, I'm blanking right here. Um, <laughs> we do uh, video um, object detection, activity detection, um, and we evaluate um, algorithms from um, outside participants. So, okay, uh, Robert Budden is next. I work for uh, the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. I'm in charge of running our 950 node Ironic HPC cluster, uh, and then we also do some community gateways and web front ends to that uh, using OpenStack VMs as well. Hi. Yep, I'm Mike Lowe. I work for Indiana University. We have um, a project called Jetstream. It is the first NSF production cloud system. And uh, we have two 300 node clouds. And uh, I'm the <coughs> architect, I guess, of that. I'm Blair Bethwaite from Monash University in Australia. Um, so we run part of the Nectar Research Cloud in Australia. Uh, and we run two data centers, three zones, and about uh, 10,000 cores on our cloud at Monash. Hi, I'm Jonathan Mills. I work at um, the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Um, I work on the HPC cluster called um, Discover, which is the sister cluster to Pleiades. You, it's a cluster you may have heard of. Um, I also do OpenStack stuff. Um, if you've ever seen the photos of the inf infamous sort of uh, nebula container that was the first uh, you know, iteration of Nova, um, we, we, we rebuilt that, and my OpenStack cloud runs in that. So. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Marshall. Uh, I work for a company called Data Machine Corp. and. Uh, we do, we do uh, data analytics and data analytics infrastructure. I'm uh, with uh, Stig and Blair, uh, co-chair for the Scientific SIG, and uh, I've been doing uh, you know, distributed computing for the past 20 years. I did my PhD in MPI, see if that <laughs> help people understand what my background is. Uh, we're gonna be, if I can find my mouse. Uh, so here is a question that uh, we have just to get started. Uh, for people who have a computer, like I said, the Etherpad URL, is uh, on the screen. Feel free to go there, feel free to add questions. Uh, the only reason we're doing that is that we're gonna try to at least give a little background into, uh, into what we're doing and then uh, I wanna say in, in about 15 minutes we'll, uh, we'll open the floor for everybody to be able to ask their own question uh, using microphones, please. Uh, so first, uh, what is your HPC use case? I'm gonna to try to limit it, uh, as I said earlier, to try to free people. So whoever wants to talk about HPC use case, uh, steal I can start, yep. <laughs> uh, so for the SKA project, what we are doing at the moment, because it's very early days, it's, um, it's going into production in the early 2020s. And, but when it does, it's gonna be enormous. 
um, a quarter of an exaflop of uh, processing power. And what, but, but in order to do that, because we, we simply don't have the budget to, to squander on um, any kind of overhead incurred on that machine, we have to make the right choices at the moment in terms of the kind of architecture, both in terms of hardware and in terms of software, and indeed in terms of the, the infrastructure management, so where, where OpenStack comes in. So the, the project that we're involved in at the moment is really about creating using OpenStack uh, to get the, the most flexibility out of a high-performance bare metal architecture. So we need to be able to expose as much as we can of the, um, uh, the methods of tuning, uh, the, uh, the, the hardware, the operating system, and the BIOSes and the other things, and, and at the same time not sacrifice any of the flexibility of, of cloud APIs, or at least not as, um, as little as we can. So it, it's kind of a unique experiment in that um, um, really what we're doing is we're trying to use OpenStack for its flexibility as a tool in order to understand how we can unlock the best out of a, um, a giant scale HPC system. That machine will also be running OpenStack but in a very different kind of context because it will be in a production footing but uh, delivering this sort of huge data ingest, huge processing capacity. All right, well, I got the mic now. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I can just tell you quickly about my use cases. Um, so we run um, evaluations and um, we, run, we run systems in-house and we have uh, data sets that we use and we want to um, keep those data sets, um, we want to keep them and not give them out so that we can reuse them for, for developing these, these algorithms. So um, we're using OpenStack, again, for the flexibility um, that we can repurpose hardware um, depending on, on how it's being best used. Okay, so we are actually funded at, at two different centers and, and sort of competing projects, but we're funded out of the same uh, solicita solicitation. So we have the same mandate to uh, fix one of the problems that the NSF has, the National Science Foundation. They have uh, about 350,000 people who could use their funded resources and about 3% actually do. So our our mandate is to to bring all the users who aren't using uh, the existing traditional HPC resources into the fold. And so what we've done at, at Jetstream is try and make OpenStack easier to use and try and leverage the flexibility of OpenStack to service all these use cases that aren't really covered by traditional batch systems. And so at PSC, we're kind of uh, in the other spectrum where we're trying to bridge uh, these new communities with traditional type of batch HPC work. So we use Ironic uh, in, with Puppet as more of a provisioning agent for the HPC resource uh, and a way to kind of dynamically change the nodes from you know, your Slurm backend HPC to maybe transforming them into Nova computes when we need them uh, or into a small mini Hadoop cluster or any other type of nodes that our users would need and then we can reliably bring it back um, to a well-known base image that runs back under our Slurm scheduler when they're done. Um, well, so I work at a university, so we have um, just about every use case under the sun, I guess. Um, and But also a, a large population of very naive users as well, so people who are just essentially replacing you know, a server that was under their desk with a server that's on the cloud now, um, but still not utilizing it very well. Um, so I guess I'm kind of interested in how we can help those people take the next step and how maybe container orchestration technology and so on is going to come in and, and help um, with efficiency in some of those use cases as well because I think we're not, we could, we could probably do a lot better on that front. Like OpenStack has been very good for us in terms of getting servers out from underneath desks uh, but we've, we've still got a long way to go in terms of upping the efficiency. Um, but we also run, you know, that's that's one angle of the workloads. We also run our production HPC services on top of OpenStack as well, and in a hybrid setting. So we're actually doing a lot of that stuff virtualized, but we also then have a mix of bare metal stuff in there too. Yeah, so I think it would be misleading to say that NASA's interested in running HPC work on OpenStack, when you have a five petaflop supercomputer, you want to run HPC work on that. But OpenStack is a very complementary resource to an HPC computer. Uh, not everybody can write MPI or write it well. Um, not everybody's interested in doing that sort of work. Um, not everybody's interested in using a batch scheduler. 
Um, there, and just like um, just like what Blair was saying, um, we have the same kind of scientific community where people have servers in their closets under their desks, and NASA wants to get rid of supporting that stuff and move them into into the cloud and and get to a sort of a cloud first strategy that's a lot easier to manage. Um, so at uh, Data Machines, we uh, support a lot of uh, specific program, often for DARPA. Uh, and what that means is that we have to design infrastructures that are very smart for them to be used uh, by a ton of researchers. We're talking, we're talking uh, a couple hundreds government environments, uh, multiple thousand users, and what we do is we design those architectures so that uh, we deploy things that uh, make it possible for them to do their work, obviously, to do research, but also uh, deploy environments that are compatible for type of sequestered uh, environment where you want to run on a data set, but you want, don't want to see the data set. So a lot of the technology we use are OpenStack, Kubernetes, Mesos, Docker, GitLab is a you know very popular item, uh, free IPA, all of that, uh, uh, and uh, and we do a lot of work that makes it possible for those users to basically, uh, just like most people supporting academia, you know, not have to worry too much about the architecture, but being able to, I'm going to generate a code, it's going to be containerized, it's going to be pushed, it's going to run on 200 thousand pictures or whatever you you're working on and then you get a result and uh, you just have to worry about processing your result it's about the automation uh, methodology uh, we're gonna go quickly for the second one because not everybody has a specialized HPC architecture but some of us have a very specialized HPC so I figure uh, you know uh, very specialized hardware so uh, what do you guys run um. We have a real zoo uh, to experiment, um, something of everything at the moment, and OpenStack mediates this sort of um, heterogeneous computing environment. The way that we do that is through using Kola for our control plane, and I cannot recommend that enough because um, we originally started out with an RPM-based uh, installation, and you very quickly get into, uh, tangled with um, dependencies, particularly when you need to upgrade a single service or something. So. Kola has been a great liberator uh, for us in terms of the OpenStack architecture. Everything else builds on top of that. Um, we've been doing a lot of R&D about how to do scalable deployments because we're targeting something like 50,000 compute nodes uh, with the production environment. So um, we don't use uh, AAA. We've actually gen been working on an R&D project to create a system which is based on Bifrost to deploy the control plane and then collar is paved on top, and that is called KUB or collar on Bifrost. So, yeah. uh, and uh, I know that uh, you have you've released that actually uh, publicly. Yes, yes, it's in the OpenStack Big Tent now. So, um, so that's the tool we use. It, it enables us from the very beginning, from talking about talking to the BMCs and um, the network switches, everything from there to you know doing the finishing touches on on paving the applications and configuring uh, things like Slurm. It's all Ansible. So everything is a common format and a common modus operandi, and that's a big liberator for us. Uh, maybe Robert? I'm just going to say we use GPUs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we use uh, consumer grade and the, uh, the ones NVIDIA wants us to use. <laughs> so at PSC, we've kind of had uh, niche machines. Uh, so we were the first deployer of Intel's OmniPath. Um, all 950 nodes of our HPC cluster are connected by uh, this interconnect, so we do a lot of uh, codes that are large memory or uh, large message passing, and then uh, we we mix that with uh, different flavors of memory. So we have uh, a dozen three terabyte nodes, and we have four 12 terabyte nodes for people that are doing incredibly large memory jobs. To run uh, Windows? <laughs> yeah, so we actually are running right now, we have a one and a half terabyte Windows VM uh, that is running for a uh, a user that has some C-sharp code. Uh, we don't want to talk about that right now, though. we we'll talk about that later. <laughs> IIS is a pretty memory-hungry web server, isn't it? Very boring. Okay. Nothing, nothing exciting. Oh, come on. Um, uh, yeah, well, I guess briefly. Uh, so we've been doing this since 2012, so we've got everything from old AMD bulldozer stuff through Sandy, Ivy. Uh, Haswell, Broadwell, and now the newer Xeon processors. Um, 
and you know that all that all seems to work pretty well. Uh, the other one, one interesting thing that we're, we're thinking about doing at the moment is um, for our HPC workloads, sort of buying kit for them and then retiring it into general purpose cloud usage uh, at a higher rate than you would normally do that um, for a HPC system that you might just refresh every four to five years. Um, and Stone said doing that on a rolling cycle. Um, yeah, we do GPU and all that stuff too. Uh, my largest cluster for OpenStack is um, 144 uh, Dell 60 C6320 Broadwell nodes. Um, they they work okay. Um, uh, they're all dual 10 gig connected to separate leaf switches. It's a leaf spine architecture uh, running uh, Mellanox SN 2100 100 gigabit per second uh, Ethernet switches which are also quite nice, running Cumulus Linux. Um, currently not doing any fancy VLAN, VXLAN stuff like, like this guy, but um, you know, M lags everywhere, that sort of thing. Um, 256 gig of RAM, yeah, so. <laughs> um, so uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna skip a couple of questions. If you have specific questions for, for the panelists, we're gonna be staying a little bit after feel free to uh, to ask us especially uh, you know uh, what's your most unusual discipline I'm sure the war stories are going to be some things that uh, we will want to share but we're going to try to uh, first answer a couple more questions uh, one of the first question is uh, how many of your researchers are using environment running of OpenStack so we're t asking about a number of group and percentage of user it looks like uh, for university oops, sorry for university in particular uh, what does that? How does that represent in your in your pool of user? Uh, it, it's a I, so I mean you, you can answer that question from a few different dimensions, um, and I don't have the the numbers off the top of my head. But for every for every OpenStack project or tenant, we um, when when we give them an allocation, we actually we also ask them how many other users they might be supporting. Um, so that number is much greater, and that's the number I have no idea what what it is. Um, but we have, I think, so broadly on on the Nectar Research Cloud, we have about ten thousand users. There's about maybe six thousand active users or something. Is that right? Um, at, but at Monash, I think we've got at the moment. Um, I think last time I looked at it, it might be about four hundred, four or five hundred projects active on on our part of the infrastructure. They're not necessarily only Monash projects. Uh, they could be. They could be from other places around as well. Um, in the HPC space, though, we really just run. We have sort of like two main anchor tenants, which are our our strategic HPC and our kind of our campus uh, playground HPC facility, which run out of that. Yeah. So uh, we have. Jetstream, I think we have 2,400 active users, and there are, I believe, about 28,000 active users on the national uh, on the national resources. So we we run in yeah, close to 10 percent. Uh, I'll have to ask our user services guys sitting in the audience there about how many uh, about how many projects we have active right now. 304 active projects at the moment. That's pretty cool. Uh, anybody else or? I know for us, for our, as far as our OpenStack, I won't count the bare metal usage because that's the majority of it. Uh, but as far as the VMs are concerned, it's a very small portion, um, probably under 5%. But that's largely because our VMs are mostly web gateways or web front ends. Um, people doing Galaxy or doing Open On Demand or Jupyter Hub, uh, something where they need to talk, they need a web front end to submit jobs to Slurm. Uh, for some of these scientific communities that aren't super familiar with batch jobs, they need a, a prettier interface to be able to run their scientific codes. So you're actually running into the next question. Uh, do your HPC use any job scheduler? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we use Slurm on the back end for ours. Uh, we've used PBS in the past or Torque, the open source Torque. Yeah, we use, um, so there's many uses of the, um, uh, the SK development platform. Um, but one of them is, is Slurm, which is provisioned by Heat and then post-configured by Ansible. Um, in that, we run an open HPC environment. Um, but, but that's not the only uh, sort of job scheduler. It, well, it's the most, most conventional one, but um, uh, the machine also supports um, RDMA-enabled Spark, 
as well. And um, and we've been doing a lot of work with um, container orchestration as well, so Docker Swarm principally. And um, and we've been looking at um, using Jupyter Notebooks as a mediation or as interface, and then having Dask behind that, which would be demand scaled um, across the machine. So um, that's that's another area where, where we're looking at. And that really are, speaks to this kind of non-conventional uh, or the non-traditional uh, usage of um, HPC resources, and it it seems to fit pretty well. Yeah, I think it was actually part of the conversations this morning. I remember you, you think it was uh, dust came up. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. it did. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna ask about uh, the type of application and uh, that are that are run on your on your cloud. I know it totally depends on what you know your users are doing. So uh, maybe just give us one or two example of what you know is being run. On, on your cloud? Yeah, okay. And go ahead. Um, well, for, say in our HPC environment, that's very much focused on character, uh, characterization science, which is essentially image processing, uh, but from lots of different image mo imaging modalities. Um, so Monash has a synchrotron across the road, and that has a whole bunch of different instruments attached to it, different beam lines, um, and things like uh, well, we built we built one specific expansion of that environment just to cater to um, cryo electron microscopy, uh, which we have the first facility in Australia for that. Um, and there's a bunch of other new and very um, heavy data generating microscopes coming down the pipeline, like uh, lattice light sheet is one interesting technology, which will once it's once it's working properly, get to the point of generating volumetric movies essentially. Um, so you could leave a sample in this thing overnight and come back with 20 to 40 terabytes of data in the morning. So uh, I'll add to that question, and I think that's particular for uh, Mike. Uh, I know you've been looking at how to better uh, understand what your users are doing on your cloud. Uh, so uh, how, how does that influence what you allow your user to do? And we're talking also about how to better charge them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, I mean, when I, when I was learning how to run an HPC system, um, the, the guy who taught me everything I know said once that, uh, you know, a batch system is like a hotel. You know, as long as you leave it like you found it, you get it for a few hours and we don't really care what you do with it. Mm -hmm. And and I, I kind of treat our OpenStack thing much more like a condo, <laughs> right? As long as you don't burn down the walls, then, you know, the inside is yours to do with what you want. That being said, you know, the machine is purchased by the funding agency and we just run it for them. And so they are responsible to the funding agency to run, you know, to run applications and not not Bitcoin mine, unless of course that is their research, <laughs> uh, which may or may not be the case, despite of their claims. So uh, as academia, and you you get you get grants to buy to buy hardware. One of the questions is related: Do you see a role for ARM, or uh, I guess uh, in the OpenStack HPC future? So do you, is that something that? I would say for us, that's probably out of the question. As you know, I have a chip and embedded design background, and I would love to. I love alternate architectures, but I just don't see a, a future at our scale because we, you know, our power uh, relative to our H, our campus HPC systems is, is it doesn't compare. You know, um, so it, we wind up running a lot of legacy code, and that stuff's just not getting ported. Yeah. So, I. As much as it pains me, I don't see a future myself. Okay. Does anybody have something to add to that? Um, we have a, um, a number of ARM nodes in our system. And um, they're actually from a storage vendor who's on the marketplace here called uh, SoftIron. So it, it doesn't matter that it's ARM. Um, what is interesting about those machines is that they have a um, SOC, a SOC, inside. And it's got 14 SATA interfaces direct on the, uh, on the processor and two 10 gig Ethernet. Um, ports as well. And that means that for a relatively low powered, in terms of compute power, um, processor, you can actually get very good uh, utilization overall. So that's one of the machines we've been evaluating. The fact that it's ARM is, is not relevant to that particularly. It's, this, it's, it's the overall system architecture in this case that uh, makes it shine. Sure. So uh, as a follow up, uh uh, there is always a question of uh, well, we have supercomputer. Is that I think Jonathan is going to be answering that question. You you have a ton of users that are really relying on your uh, your uh, supercomputer, uh, but uh, and I think uh, Bob also can answer that. Uh, do you see uh, do you see a, a, an evolution toward uh, open infrastructure like we're doing with OpenStack that becomes part of those supercomputer? 
Um, you can skip to Bobby. Well, <laughs> um, so, well, I, I think that the the HPC culture is a bit conservative at this point, and probably not ready to jump on a cloud technology. But if I if I had to guess the one component of OpenStack that would come into our HPC cluster first, it would probably be the bare metal provisioning system, Ironic. I mean, we currently provision with IBM XCAT, and that's a mature and, and pretty good product, but there are questions about um, how well is that being supported at this point and going forward, whereas it seems like Ironic is just kind of getting better and better and better. And so uh, I could potentially see us switching over to that at some point. Just, yeah. uh, just a small announcement. Uh, I'm gonna, in order to allow people to come to the microphone, I'm gonna ask you to stop adding questions to the Etherpad. We're gonna try to, uh, to answer the last four and then move forward. Uh, yes, Bob, go ahead. Please. I was gonna say, uh, kind of complimentary what John said. Uh, I see right now OpenStack being more like tools to kind of help uh, aid in uh, HPC land. Um, and kind of the cooperation between these non-traditional communities, softwares, um, and, and then adopting them as tools to, to make your infrastructure work better. So I'm not sure about the long term. I know, the, as John said, the mentality in the HPC world is, is largely against virtualization, um, you know, to the perceived uh, performance uh, and problems with it. But it's going to be an overcoming hurdle that we have to, we have to address. Yeah, the thing that um, is going to change the game is when OpenStack clouds are able to control the maximum latency on any particular operation. Uh, because the, the nature of the applications that are running in an HPC environment, working in lockstep, box synchronous, parallel kind of applications, they're always waiting for the slowest guy. And if there's 100,000 cores and they're waiting for the 100,000th core to finish because it's on the 99.999th percentile of the long tail, that really sucks. So the the fact that cloud has such a greater sort of divergence in time to perform any kind of IOP or, or um, processing activity is going to be the limiting factor in terms of scaling applications in the cloud for high performance computing. So uh, I'm going to try to merge a couple of questions here. Um, so first a question for uh, for a couple of uh, people that have knew my work and I don't, I think that's basically the two of you. Uh, uh, about the uh, GPUs, uh, do you see GPUs being uh, being uh, used efficiently uh, to run Numa, Numa type of work? Um, so, if I can interpret that question properly, then no. So, the uh, I mean, in the naive configuration, so I'm looking at the anyone mapping GPUs to Numa zones and VMs. Um, then the virtual PCI bus presented in the guest is flat. Um, although the um, the interrupt mapping is handled by QMU, I believe. Um, I forget how that works now, but we certainly haven't found, with, with doing PCI pass-through, yeah. um, we certainly haven't found any performance problems with that. Um, the main... The main outstanding issue that we have performance-wise for HPC workloads inside KVM is uh, huge pages with large machines. Um, so you can't, you can't use static huge pages with a machine above a certain size because it will take QMU too long to allocate the pages when it starts and libvirt then times out. So then you have to rely on transparent huge pages and they that will work fine after a host is booted and then you bring up a, a bit one big guest but over time the number of anonymous huge pages will drop on the host and so we've got we we actually have one particular code which is a cryo em thing which we can run it's like a 30 second test which should take 30 seconds and when it starts taking two minutes we know that that host needs to be rebooted <laughs> okay um Next question is, uh, and I, maybe just a number on that one, uh, how many unique type of images uh, do, uh, do uh, you have to maintain? Although I think it's basically you provide one to the user and the user uh, extend on it. So uh, uh, we have about 12. 12. Okay. 12. 12. <laughs> Great. Um, I mean, we have it like a standard uh, securely configured image that we use in house, but then with outside participants, they would have their own yeah. images. Uh, we probably have about a page full, but we're 
Probably because we're not very tidy at cleaning up, but... Um. Uh. Uh, there is a question about uh, sharing data stores to cloud instances. So they're talking about the RDMA uh, and Gateway. And uh, then there is a question, and we're going to stop there. Do you have the ability of future plans uh, to burst to other cloud? Uh, so that's uh, actually for that one. Uh, we, we just had a conversation earlier with, uh, uh, with uh, the Keystone uh, the Kistom team, because uh, we are, uh, some of us are involved with uh, something called the uh, uh, the IEEE P2302, which is a cloud federation effort to build a standard, uh, and it's about a federation of clouds, so that uh, all the cloud can work together. Right? Uh, we are going to have a meeting tomorrow as part of the Open Research Cloud Alliance, which is in room 306. Uh, all day long on uh, trying to come up with a declaration for that type of uh, of model. But what's very interesting is that uh, uh, from a conversation with uh, Morgan, Colleen, uh, it's moving forward. That type of work within OpenStack is actually being uh, being primed to make it possible for you to uh, burst to other clouds. It's a matter of figuring out how to federate the cloud to one another and how to share information. So I would I would encourage you to really talk to them. I think uh, John, uh, no, sorry, uh, John, uh, you're John. Got that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, yes, the, uh, so in terms of federation work, um, we've been involved in a project in across the UK about um, um, federating a number of the sites around the uh, the sort of the UK national research infrastructure, um, and actually a lot of that is is made possible by um, um, federated authentication mechanisms like um, the European Grid Initiative in in Europe, and I mean I'm sure there there are similar ones like is it Globus in the US or yeah that's one of them yeah yeah so actually they um, they take you a long way with with relatively little effort. I think in terms of um, federation, it's worth considering it at um, sort of a transposed way in that um, um, a lot of the users, we don't expect to be actually using or uh, interacting with the infrastructure. They're really thinking at the platform level or above. Yeah. And, and so I think in terms of federation, the greater use case is on how do we federate a platform which is running on one infrastructure with a platform that's running on another. And that's not really an OpenStack question. That's at a higher level question about how do we, um, how do we interlink these different um, uh, clusters, these different platforms. Um, so that, that I mean, that's uh, just solving the problem at a different level. I mean, I think your, your, your um, slides on, um, on Orca Federation kind of cover that as well. Yeah, and uh, so for people that are interested, please come tomorrow, room 306. It's all day, uh, you know. Uh, so and uh, last question, and then we open the floor. Uh, and it was related to uh, the type of data stores, uh, parentheses, global, uh, global file system, uh, shared to cloud instances, in particular, uh, gateways, native, or RDMA. And I think, uh, uh, I don't know, actually. <laughs> uh, so obviously, our, our HPC cluster is RDMA-based, um, and you know, back in the Liberty generation, I tried to get OpenStack to be really happy on top of InfiniBand FDR, um, and I actually got it to work, but then just felt like it was so much trouble, I kind of gave up on it. So, um, you know, our Pike clusters are Ethernet-based, and so um, to get to external GPFS file systems, which is what we have, uh, we tried NFS for a while over provider networks, but ultimately found that in some workloads, it's just too IO intensive for NFS, um, especially the people counting trees in Africa, that was terrible. Um, so in those cases, we did like sender boot from volume and literally installed GPFS clients in those VMs to c connect back to the storage, as painful as that is. Um, so yes, we do we do um, RDMA all the way into the guests uh, using Rocky uh, and use that to run Lustre clients, um, connecting back to standard bare metal Lustre. Um, our I think it was is it is it Sanger that does multi tenant has done the multi tenant Lustre setup. Um, they've got quite an interesting architecture. Um, ours is not really multi-tenant, it's only two tenants. So it's like two different provider networks and two separate lusters. Um, 
but that that's all we needed so okay so mostly we try and, and stick with with Ceph and self-contained and and not you know cinder volumes and uh, and that being said um, there is a, a another NSF project it's a it's a data centric project and we have a piece of it it's a 10 uh, petabyte luster and it sits across the hot aisle from me and so we cross mount that with NFS um, you know provider networks on a, on a couple of these um, for the people who just you know can't fit inside our inside our SF cluster so for the majority of our VM users um, we have luster mounted inside of them uh, we usually offer two types of VMs we offer some that are uh, PSC managed and some that they have full root access to uh, we find the large portion of our users don't really need root um, or, or want the, uh, the problem of having to maintain the VM themselves. So as long as we're maintaining it, we have luster mounted straight inside and we handle um, all, all the data needs for them. Yeah, so I'm just using Ceph with um, um, object and block storage, simple stuff. So we do a bit of everything. I mean, probably a bit of what everyone is doing. Uh, we're experimenting with. So we're experimenting with CephFS, uh, with GlusterFS, BGFS, and with Luster as well. The Luster in this case is coming from outside, but the other things would be um, scratch space provisioned intern internally to the cluster, um, usually with Manila, sometimes with um, Ansible deployments and so on. Um, in this case, they're all coming across 100 gig InfiniBand. Um, Generally, what we're finding with the comparison between those um, file systems is that CephFS is really improving very quickly, but it still has quite a long way to go in terms of the um, uh, the kind of features that the other file systems can offer. So, okay. uh, thank you, guys. I'm going to open the floor. So, if people want to ask questions, come to the microphone. Otherwise, there is one extra question here uh, about people asking about uh, FPGA requirements for workload. I just wanted to follow up on that last question. Some of you touched on it was, so do any, any of you allow mounting those external file systems when users have root on the VMs? Well, yes, but, but you have to be careful, right? Because they can lie about who they are if they have root. Uh, so, you know, submounts, that's why we do NFS. Um, you know, the Lustre submounts are coming, or it might be here now. But, you know, Subder mount is supported. Uh, th that's what I would like to see is us be able to do Lustre Subder mount possibly with uh, Kerberos authentication. Because obviously if they have root in the VMs, you need some sort of ticket-based auth or certificate-based auth in order to prevent unwanted access. When we onboard users, we find out what their use cases are and we map them to uh, what we call uh, either managed or unmanaged VMs. The managed VM images have a NASA LDAP client in them and they come in mapped as who they are and they can't escape from that. That's pretty much how we do it as well. All of the managed ones run PSC's LDAP server and, and everything else as well. So the CephFS we mount, uh, we, uh, root users can mount those and they get the keys to access them for the project. Uh, they're shared within the project using Barbican. Um, the other, the other clusters are generally provisioned within the project, so if they destroy them, they're just destroying their own stuff. So, well, I have a question for you, actually. So, have you, where are you with uh, Ganesha NFS exports? Uh, we don't use that. So, though, um, we don't re-export the uh, the CFFS stuff. And actually, because it's a bare metal environment, we just do. I think what the CERN um, people do, which is um, you just export the CFFS by um, IP routes into the storage network, which is. Uh, definitely a design call and a trade-off against the security of the overall control plane. Um, but this system is um, is not designed to be uh, rigorously secure, so we're aware of that and uh, and we we accept the risk there. So just to follow up to Mike, we we do run NFS Ganesha on Ceph um, as well for I mean for separate use cases like campus wide NAS storage, um, and that works fine. Um, so we and we use CTDB for high availability for that setup, but that's not Red Hat's plan is not to use CTDB there. Um, there's some work coming to actually integrate the high availability management with the Mon cluster natively in Ceph. So that'll be nice when that's there. But. Hi, I'm Adam Young, uh, Keystone Core. So my my question is about uh, that side of the house. 
Um, first, um, if you guys, you, you touched a little bit on what your initial provisioning is when users come in. I'd like to hear a little bit more about what you have to do there and where your pain is there. And second, um, we built a lot of features into Keystone. I'm just wondering if you're using them. And the ones I'm specifically interested in are hierarchical multi-tenancy, uh, implied roles, and um, and then, you know, to a degree, I'm pretty sure I know what your use is of federation there, but if you are using federation, any gotchas there? No, that's a lot. Yes. So um, I work with uh, with John, John Garbutt, so you probably know all about these already, but um, the, the issues that we've been having with um, uh, Federation have principally been around um, being unable to use um, higher levels OpenStack services like Heat um, because there's a, a difficulty crea creating trusts mm -hmm. uh, with federated users. And, um, and I think the same thing holds for application credentials, which we're very much um, looking to use to enable uh, users to, as, as a part of a, um, a workflow, as a deferred activity, access Swift storage to, um, uh, to stage data out of their workload, out of their burst buffer or something. So I think those are the two, um, two main issues that we're facing at the moment um, from my use case. We're, we're, I mean, I guess we're, we're not using new enough Keystone yet to really be able to take advantage of at least a couple of those features. Um, I think I, I haven't been following the all the Orca stuff, um, the Open Research Cloud, um, uh, and all the Federation discussions that that closely. But I, I think I don't know if you're planning to go to any of that stuff tomorrow. It, it would be Try to be there. Yeah. Be quite quite useful to have. Um, I guess some more technical grounding about what the current state of the art for OpenStack is within that forum. Um, yeah, that's why we that's why we talk to Keystone uh, at <laughs> lunch. <laughs> um, I guess we're actually running on time, right? We're at the end, uh, so we're gonna we can likely do one more. So we're gonna check uh, we're gonna check the list. Uh, so there was the FPGA, and I'm not understanding the last question. Uh, so, uh, do you have some workload with FPGA requirement? And uh, I know. Uh, and are, are you looking uh, to use FPGA with OpenStack Cyborg? So for uh, Cyborg was a project we started a couple a year a year ago now. Yeah. A year ago, yeah, you I can think it's conceived at the Barcelona summit. Um, yeah. I, personally, I'm more interested in um, improving GPU um, use in OpenStack because it works, but it's not pretty. Um, but yeah, I'm not using FPGAs. I mean, yes, you, there, there'll always be somebody in engineering or IT or or something somewhere that wants wants some fancy device to that it's probably been given to them by a vendor or something because they've got a crazy idea, right? <laughs> and then they desperately want us to find a box to put it in. So I mean, having some way to manage that type of stuff would be nice um, at a you know at an institutional level and also then not having to tie things to hardware um, that's dedicated to one particular person as well. Yeah. I and mean, for, for FPGA, we, we have potential use case, but it's always a matter of, uh, you need to find somebody that's able to reprogram the chip from VHDL on the go. Uh, so there is a couple of solutions to do that, uh, but uh, uh, it's more applicable when you want to work directly on data. Uh, so uh, in that particular example, you think you put your data on a, on a drive and you have a chip on the drive to do the type of work. And you'll see that there is some, a few companies that are looking into that, uh, that technology as we speak. Um, and uh, with that, I think we're, uh, we're going to conclude. So thank you, everybody, uh, for coming. Thank and you. Thank you for thank our you. Uh, yes.